Hello everyone, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I would like to welcome you all in the next um, session of, of the conference. Thank you very much for join, uh, joining us wherever you are in the world. Um, just before kickstarting uh, um, this wonderful session, I would just like to say a few words um, in honor and in memory um, of the professor uh, whose death has sh shocked and saddened France in these last couple of days. And I'd like to remind everyone that it is the privilege and the duty of academic community to support um, freedom of speech everywhere in the world. Um, thank you very much. So now I would like to kick start. We have a wonderful session with five um, invited speakers um, this, uh, this afternoon. So the very first talk will be by Bill Manro from NTT Research Center in uh, uh, Theoretical Quantum Physics in Japan. So let us hear uh, Bill talking to us about designing quantum networks. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First, let me begin this presentation by um, thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here, and also for all of you for attending from whichever um, country you are in this world. Today, I want to talk to you about designing quantum networks, how we go about it, what the constraints are going to be um, within there, and really highlight some real challenges we're going to have. My name is Bill Monroe, but this work is not done by myself alone. It's done with a team from the National Institute of Informatics, who I've listed um, at the bottom. In case you want to contact me, I've also put my email address there that may help. So what is the challenge here? The challenge is quite simple. We have very nice point-to-point um, -point QKD networks. We've seen impressive experiments with QKD operating over thousands of kilometers with trusted um, nodes. We've seen ground-to-satellite experiments. But we kind of want to build a network now or, or move towards it where we have a network like the internet today, but we want to move to a quantum internet, a quantum-enabled um, network of networks. We need to think how we do this. And we also need to remember that quantum communications is more than just um, QKD. Quantum networks are designed to support quite a variety of tasks, including communications, but also networking um, small scale quantum computers together or networking sensing networks together. It's important in quantum networks that we have entanglement distributed between um, various nodes. And for this, over long distances, we know that some repeater or repeater-like device is going to be needed. So how are we going to achieve this? We really need to think about the type of networks that we want. I mean, most of the effort at the moment, people are thinking about linear chains. And linear chains remove a lot of the complications in terms of design. It's a linear chain. We don't have to worry about how, how information flows. It just goes left to right. But then as we start moving to arbitrary networks, we may have two or three parties coming into a bottleneck that then comes out. So we need to start thinking about how do we route information in here? Then in the medium term, we know that we're going to want to do city to city, where these cities may be um, separated by hundreds of kilometers. Within these cities, we may have complicated topology of our networks, many, many nodes. And then, then really in the longer term, we know that we're going to require um, a global network, which spans continents. We need to think about when we think about quantum networking, quantum networking is not quantum alone. It really has a classical network beneath it. We need to propagate classical information as well as quantum information. So what's one of the first issues that we're going to face here? The large scale networks, as I've kind of drawn here, Alice and Bob may not know the exact path between each other. Actually, that path may change in time. So we have to be careful when we design our networks that we allow for the fact that actually we don't have complete knowledge on what's happening in the network for every user at every instant of time. 
this is going to change. So given that we're going to we're going to have these constraints, this is going to have quite an effect on the repeaters. So it's worthwhile now just highlighting um, a few of the different designs of repeaters. We call these repeater generations. Um, this um, table here was built by Liang Zhang and his team, and it kind of summarizes quite well um, where quantum repeaters may go. So the first generation is kind of what we're seeing in the labs at the moment. It's also called purification and swap. It basically has um, two main elements. It uses an, um, heralded entanglement generation to generate entanglement between adjacent nodes. That's probabilistic, but we know when it works. And then it uses a form of purification uh, to fix errors associated with local gates and various things like this. What's important here is that the rates of information that you're going to get are really going to be proportional to um, how long the network is. We're going to have to send information over that entire network. We're going to have to wait a long time. So the rates for the first generation repeaters are quite slow. Over a thousand kilometers, these could be a hertz or something like this. And the resources used are polynomial in that distance. In the second generation, we make a very simple change. We still maintain um, the transmission of entanglement between adjacent nodes by this heralded process, but we replace purification with um, one-way error correction. And what that does is using the error correction within the local gates. That means that your rate goes from being proportional to what happens over the entire network to now being limited by the distance between adjacent nodes. The resources also scale, instead of um, polynomial, they now scale polylog arithmetically. The third generation is kind of um, the biggest change. We're going to use error correction for both handling loss in the channel and loss in local nodes. And the key is, once we can do this, we have direct transmission of information available. Um, the time scales associated with the rates associated with sending information now depend on how fast you can operate within your local nodes and the resource cost is still poly polylogarithmic. What we know is that the form of the quantum repeater is going to have a profound impact on how we do networking in these quantum networks and also on the design of those networks. So let's just think about entanglement switch networks, this simple bottleneck picture that I put up before. If Alice and Bob want to talk, or they want to um, establish a bell pair, actually, in the first generation network, they've got to, they've got to um, establish a route, or they've got to establish a path, lock that path in, and then they keep that path with all the resources associated with it open as long as they want to communicate. This is kind of very much like your old telephone exchange. Create the circuit, the circuit stays there, you communicate, when you finish talking, close the circuit. And probably in the first generation of repeated protocols, we have no choice. It probably has to be circuit switched. The second and third generation approaches though, allows us to start thinking about what we use today in all of our um, telecommunication protocols, packet switch networks. They're much more user friendly, and basically you don't have to hold all the resources while they communicate, you just have to allocate them as you go. If we want to think about the second and third generation, I think for the larger scale networks, there's no doubt this is going to be what we require. We're going to have to think about quantum error corrective repeaters. So we're going to have to think about repeaters that are actually used in tangible. This is going to slow the development down in terms of hardware, but there's so many advantages associated with it. The first one is um, they're much more efficient in terms of um, switching options and routing. The first thing is that these um, quantum error corrected repeaters allow direct transmission of information. I don't just have to distribute entanglement, I can send your quantum information along because it's error corrected as it goes along. We also can, um, can start with a central node and distribute entanglement where the real big advantage in this is that the quantum and the classical information are flowing along at the same time and the potentially just flowing one way. It makes a big difference. Of course, if I want to look at these um, error corrected repeaters and especially the third generation, I've got to think about error correction codes. We have many choices. 
you can use the parity cat binomial reed solomon surface you have a zoo of them but you have to have codes that handle both loss in a very nice way very efficiently and also um, local gate errors. It's important that once we start thinking about the loss errors, to remember that we can't cure more than 50% of the errors. That's an upper bound on the code. So it means that in these high generation repeaters, the distance between nodes is gonna be um, limited. So now we need to start thinking a little bit about routing. And just looking back at the classical world, we kind of have two types of routes. We have static and dynamic. Static you kind of, into the routers, the path between Alice and Bob is, is pre-configured. Or it's manually added and once it's there, that's always used. The dynamic route, on the other hand, learns as it goes along. And it leads to, dynamic routes lead to centralized routing, distributed routing protocols. It's kind of the way that we really work today. So what can we do in the quantum world? In the quantum world, of course, we can use these classical concepts. But we can actually also send um, quantum information via different parts at the same time. So we can start thinking about a quantum route and quantum network aggregation. So before I do that, I really want to think about multiplexing because we have to remember something. If we're sending a single photon down the channel, most of the time as a community, we're using that single photon for one qubit of information. Of course, photons can carry much more than that. So if they can carry much more than that, why don't we use them that way? Why don't we use hyperentanglement, multiple degrees of freedom naturally? One of the things we have to think about is loss. If I, if I lose that photon, I lose much more than just my one qubit. So is it an advantage or is it a disadvantage? That's something we actually have to sort out. So I kind of want to highlight um, with a very old fashioned code, the redundancy code, how um, multiplexing could work in this case. So here, consider the simplest multi multiplex code here requires six photons where I create an entangled state like this. It's just a very, very simple, simple code in terms of one of the bases. And then realizing that actually a photon can carry more than one bit of information, I can write my photons here, but this, this photon here has, has part of the qubit from here and part of the qubit from here, this one, here, and here. So basically now my qubit is, is carrying information from more than one block, if I call these blocks. So three photons, six qubits. Okay, now it's a disaster. What happens if I lose one photon? What happens if I lose this photon here, which I've kind of depicted in the below? Actually, what we notice is that this block has been affected, this block has been affected, but this block hasn't been, the redundancy code, as long as I get one block through intact, I can recover the information. So, so loss may not be that much of a disadvantage. So looking at this in a little more detail, I'm drawing a couple of curves here. This is the sixth um, photon curve here, the, the first one that we had. As soon as we bring in this three photon case, I move to this curve here and we see that actually the success probability, the probability of all the photons of getting information through is much, much higher when you actually use multiplexing in this case. The only way to beat um, this curve here is you can go from a six photon redundancy code to seven photons, so you use more resources and you can potentially exceed that. But using the three photon here is very, very important. It actually shows that multiplexing may have an advantage. Of course, the redundancy is really a toy code in that sense. So much more useful code, one of the more, more modern ones, is the quantum Reed solomon code, which I kind of give this simple example down here in terms of q with a zero, one, and two logical states. And I'm just drawing a circuit here to say, to show kind of how we can encode um, those q into, um, a qubit based um, photonic code. But the key that I wanna show here is that once I can do this, I can look at the performance of this code and I kind of draw this here. This is a code where it's, um, where there's no, no multiplexing at all. 
when I start multiplexing, say when I allow, when I allow five qubits or five qubits per photon, actually I can say both resources in terms of the number of qubits and the number of photons being used. So actually multiplexing here in the in codes like the read supplement actually is saving me resources in terms of the number of qubits I need within my repeated devices and the number of photons that I need to transmit along the channel. And importantly, multiplexing here only requires extra optical switches. There's nothing really strange in here. So let's start thinking about quantum aggregation. It's one of the concepts I mentioned earlier. So a quantum packet, this qubit, it could take one, it could, it could go this way, or it could go this way, but why can't it take both? Why would I want to take both? What if we have the situation where we have constrained resources? There's not enough resources in this path here to send this information reliably across it, and there's not enough, there's not enough resources in this one to send it over. If I could use both of these resources together, maybe I can. And so the kind of concept is that I'm going to have Alice and Bob, I'm going to have N1 um, channels here with a certain transmission probability, I'm going to have N2 here with another transmission probability, so they don't so they represent the going different paths. I want to look at the situation where the success of getting this information through is 0.995, is very high, but if we're doing computation, that's probably where we need it. So does aggregation help in this case? And the simple answer is yes. So we're just going to look here at this kind of complicated um, diagram. So basically, um, I can see if I look at the, this black curve here, this is a case where all the resources are in one channel. And then when I start allocating resources to the second channel, I can get to, I can get to the stage where, um, where I can decrease my probabilities that I require coming to each channel. So multiplexing actually, multiplexing and aggregation may be even better. So here, I'm just going to think about aggregation with the multiplexing first in cases where all the all the multiplexing is done on the one qubit, and I draw here quite a large um, Reed, quantum Reed Solomon code with it's a two two one one, but we see here um, what the curves do in a sense, and so that you can see that actually with having one hundred qubits in channel two. Even if Q2 is quite bad, it can help get, get information through. Alternatively, I can actually um, have the photons encoding information from different QDITs, and it's a much harder problem, but, but actually we see a similar effect here. What else can multiplexing and aggregation do? We kind of hinted this in the previous diagram anyway. So actually, if we step back a slide, we see that um, for this 211 case, if I have 100 qubits in the second channel, they can have vanishingly small success probability, or even for 50, the success probability of them helping, they don't have to be perfect, they can actually be quite bad and still enable things. So that actually what quantum aggregation does with multiplexing is it gives us redundancy. It gives us reliability. I could have someone come through and chop my path and my information will still get through. Even though this has a number of, um, has got a number of channels sitting inside it, as long as there's enough sitting in the other ones and they're being used and losing a few doesn't hurt me too much. So building a system that's kind of resilient to link failure, I think is an important constraint because basically nodes are gonna die, our networks are not gonna be perfect. So being able to share the information out and using the different paths to give that um, robustness, I think is a very important concept. And probably more importantly, um, it really gives us a way to start thinking about what we need to do. We want to build robust networks. We don't want networks where chopping one path kills things. So 
Given my time is almost up, let's just summarize what we have. And this is just a few key points. We really need to think very heavily about network design. And now, we need to decide how we're going to have these um, larger scale quantum networks um, operating because this is going to have a profound effect on what hardware we need. We also need to think in terms of the design, how we can save resources, both in terms of resources within the, um, the nodes, the repeaters, and also the number of photons we use. Multiplexing is essential, I believe, going forward. Next, there's no reason that quantum information has to go along one path. You can put it over multiple, over multiple paths. And these multiple paths actually allow you to save even more resources. Further, the multiple paths give you natural redundancy. So given my time is up, let me thank you as an audience um, for listening, and I am open to your questions. Very much, uh, Bill, for this very nice uh, talk. Um, so, so let's see. Um, so, I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you while waiting for possible questions from the audience. I wanted to ask you about scaling. So, you focused a lot on the um, on the Reed Solomon code. Um, can you tell us if there are more options and if these options uh, is, is it because it presents the best payoff as a code for scaling? How do the resources scale for the aggregation and the multiplexing? This is basically what. I mean, so, so basically, I mean, the Reed Solomon is just an example. Um, and is it the best code? No. I mean, you may want to go G to the GKP, but what you want is a what you need is a code that actually um, has good loss scalings, which the Reed Solomon does. But so does the GKP code. But you also need something where you're not using too many photons. So one of the questions that you have is if you start using GKP and it's using coherent states that's sending multiple photons along. So how do you do realistic resource counting? And how do you um, multiplex um, coherent states? I mean, we've, we've played as well. We've done the redundancy code. We've done the Reed Solomon. We played with the surface codes. We played with a lot of the codes that are actually out there. Most of them actually work as long as, as, long as they're a code that can be decomposed onto um, quite a number of qubits. So you have a lot of flexibility here. And actually, which code you want to use is probably going to come down to what your physical hardware is. So basically, your hardware is going to determine so much because what are the errors in your local gate? Those errors are going to actually um, force you to think about, okay, this code is going to be slightly better for dealing with those errors, maybe defacing of your memories or various things like this. So, I mean, you have flexibility, but... But you, we're at the stage where we've come from the top down, but we now need to really look at what's happening at the at the bottom layer, what the experimenters are giving coming up. Okay, I see. So this is interesting that it depends on the hardware. So it's up to us to decide, experimentalists to decide what code to implement. You are the <laughs> okay. um, I, want reality. <laughs> I wanted to also ask you a more forward-looking um, uh, question. Um, so, do you predict a fourth generation of quantum repeaters? Or do you think we're done, that the third generation will be the good one? That's an interesting question. I mean, the when you look at the difference, the difference between the repeater generations at the moment, I mean, the first generation is really probabilistic entanglement distribution and probabilistic um, purification or error detection. The second generation is still these, this heralded entanglement distribution, but it's also um, using error correction for the local gates. The third generation is error correction for both. So the question is, what you've got to ask is, what is better than error correction in both? So if I'm already using error correction for loss and I'm using error correction for my local gates, then maybe the fourth generation means that I have to have qubits that don't require error correction. Maybe they're the fourth generation, but actually, do they exist? That's really an open question that we're hearing a few talks on this. So basically, my guess is what we'll see is that we'll see these three generations subdivided into smaller categories. These are very broad paintbrushes. 
and you're really going to have to focus on 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 some of the real details sitting within these. So the fourth generation, I think, is possible, but then you've either got to then you've got to move outside error correction for both to mm. something more efficient. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. We have one question from the audience that I would like to relate to you. Um, so this is <coughs> from Sidara Seluri. Um, when you did the multiplexing, can we just multiplex qubits from the same block to a photon um, so that it is more efficient if the photon is lost? So you actually can't multiplex um, from the same block because one of the things, especially in the redundancy code, is that there is a requirement that if you have um, three blocks, one block must have all the qubits arrive in it. The other two blocks must have at least one one qubit of information. So if you do, if a block comes from one photon and you lose that photon, you you lose the block, you're destroyed. So basically, with the redundancy code and multiplexing, you've got to multiplex over different blocks. So so basically, you you can't have what looks like it's it's the simple case. Unfortunately, I wish we could. Okay. Okay. Um. So the same uh, the same audience member also asked um, if you can say a bit more. On the, the on the fact that the on the comment that the first generation repeaters do not have a choice. Okay, so choice. so I mean I'm being a little bit whimsical in that comment, but one of the I think when you start looking at long distance um, re repeater networks at the moment, one of the things that we've got to think about, at least in the purifying swap, is this is really built on a pyramid-like structure that basically you start generating um, entanglement between adjacent peers and you scale out. That means you need to know where the entire network is and all of these things have to happen in parallel. If you don't do this, so that requires that you lock in your, um, your path, you have to lock the resources, you have to create your circuit in advance because what happens if suddenly part of the circuit is not there? The circuit's not there, everything fails. You could do a left to right scheme, but this would be incredibly slow. And the problem with the left to right scheme is what happens when one link fails? If one link fails, then you have to start everything again. So basically, I really pr believe that probably um, circuit switching is probably what we'll be forced to um, for the first generation. I don't see an official way to do it otherwise. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, unfortunately. Okay. Um, thanks, Billy. So we also have a, um, a very general question by Sumen Data. How can you explain the future of quantum networks? How secure will be the network? What is your opinion, Billy? Ah, it's a very, very interesting question. And I mean, so so one of the, so it's, a, it's an interesting question is because, I mean, quantum networks, we always talk about naturally having security. But actually, quantum networks are potentially about distributing entanglement. That entanglement can be used in quantum key distribution or blind computation. So the entanglement gives you some security, but it's not inherently, it's not an, it's not inherent. It's a system design. So if I start with an entanglement-based scheme where I do even with the, the higher generation left to right, if I have an eavesdropper at one of the middle nodes that takes all the information, there's no security. So the security requires an extra constraint in the system that um, there's something that eavesdropper can't get. So in, in a lot of um, networks, we teleport information. We've generated the entangled state. Once the entangled state is there, then I teleport. That we can verify that Alice and Bob have that. But if I do direct transmission, then there's no security in it. But that's a conscious choice. So quantum networks could be ultra secure if you design them that way, but you have to decide what applications you want. If you want to make them ultra secure, there's a cost. And that's probably the rate or, or various things like this that you're going to use along the way. If I want um, straight um, broadcast and I'm not worried about security in to the, that higher degree, I'm probably more efficient. So it's kind of like today's network. There's nothing wrong with the third generation as well. I can add security on top of it. So basically, <laughs> I'm quantum computation. So what I could do is before, the scene, before I send them from that logical qubit of information, I could just um, flip the bit, flip the bases or do X, Y, Z rotation or identity and use the concepts from blind computation to give extra security into these because the eavesdropper won't know what that extra basis is. 
So you actually have choices and security for a lot of repeater schemes is naturally built in, but it doesn't have to be. And you have to think when you make your design, do you want it? And Absolutely. I mean, that's going to be application specific. I think for computation, maybe you don't. I think for communication, yes. Very good. On this uh, very nice note, <laughs> I will conclude uh, the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Bill, for a fantastic talk. And thank you, everyone, for the questions. Thanks, Bill. Thank